and welcome to Paper Pilgrims, a new literary podcast. Travel with us through time as we explore books from around the world. I'm Sneha Nagesh. And I'm Alex Breeden. In this episode, we are uh, talking about the Temple of the Golden Pavilion. In the last episode, we covered some ground and this is part two of that same series. Yes, and we're starting with the much-promised uh, Nanzenji Temple episode. So Nanzenji Temple is one of my most favorite places in Kyoto, in Japan. It is one of the most important Zen temples in all of Japan. It's beautiful. It's surrounded by mountains and forests. It has loads of history. It's as old as, I think it, it dates back to the 13th century. When you go there, it's like a complex of temples and sub-temples and uh, there's a huge gate called the Sanmon Gate which is you can just sit there for ages and you know contemplate on life and, and the universe and everything. And the, and the characters in the novel also they go up in that gate. So yeah so Nansen Temple is a really lovely place and we start this episode with the two characters of the golden the Temple of the Golden Pavilion. So Mizoguchi who is the protagonist and Surukawa who is his friend, who, who are both at Nanzenji Temple. They're visiting the temple and they're just walking around it. Yeah, and then after some time sort of putting around, they end up at a, a section called the Tenju Hermitage, which is in the back of the temple complex somewhere. It's being used for a tea ceremony, and there's a woman there who's in this really gorgeous kimono, which is sort of very eye-catching because at the time, people were still in their less colorful like wartime clothes whereas this woman is obviously not yeah and she brings tea to some guy who looks like an army officer and then we have this scene it was then that the unbelievable happened still sitting absolutely straight the woman suddenly loosened the collar of her kimono i could almost hear the rustling of the silk as she pulled the material of her dress from under the stiff sash then i saw her white breasts I held my breath. The woman took one of her full white breasts in her own hands. The officer held out a dark, deep-colored teacup and knelt before her. The woman rubbed her breast with both hands. I cannot say that I saw it all, but I felt distinctly, as though it had all happened directly before my eyes how the white warm milk gushed forth from her breast into the deep green tea which foamed inside that cup, how it settled into the liquid, leaving white drops on the top, how the quiet surface of the tea was made turbid and foamy by that white breast. This just reminds me, in like in London, there was like some... For a brief time, there was some store that was selling like breast milk ice cream. Yes, in Covent Garden. Uh, and it made the Daily Mail and the the Metro, which is the daily newspaper you get in the tube, for a while. They had to stop, right? They had to stop. I mean, I didn't try it personally. Uh, I had no interest in doing that. But I had colleagues who did. <laughs> Obviously, I mean, they didn't have a an imagination of what breast milk tasted like before. So they weren't really uh-huh. able to, you know, it was very hard for them to describe it. I still remember. It was just strange. But it tasted milky or something like that. Anyway, we digress. Getting back to the, the quote, though. Uh, I mean, this is one of the most memorable scenes in the entire book to me. I mean, like reading it, having not read it for 10 years, this was the literally the one thing I remember from the entire book. That's a bit extreme, Alex. <laughs> no, I'm serious, though. I'm 100% serious. It's, it's very visual. Yes. Well, first of all, you're in this super zen temple that you know as we were describing before it's like this it's a place where you go to meditate it's quiet and it's calm you feel at peace there and so for the scene to happen there in front of these two guys who are i mean they're they're kids because they're in middle school really you can imagine the kind of how how they would perceive it and i think after the scene for a while surakawa and mizoguchi and especially mizoguchi of course who's who's narrating this this book is thinking about this scene for a long time and yeah. they tried to find at, at first I think they can't find any reason for why this might have happened but then they're trying to think about logical explanations for why a woman might have deemed it good or why why she thought that it was a good idea to take her breast milk and, and give it out to another man and they come up with something which I thought was very well they don't know whether it's true but they think that it's because 
she is so this lady is uh, bidding farewell to a man with whom she's going to have a child and he's going off to war and they think right. that he might not come back and he might die so but, but, but why would still doesn't answer the question to me like why would she, it's like i think it's a question? it's a way of representing the connection between the family the, uh-huh. the parents and and the child and the, the fact that the father might die so he still he might not experience his child but he has experienced what the child will experience when it's born which is the breast milk yeah i mean that makes sense but in, in terms of like mishima's schema i don't understand like what does it have to do with right his interpretation of beauty or activity or anything like that so mizuguchi who's the narrator uh, he's always in conflict between like evil and what's evil and what's not evil and what's good and what's bad and what's dark and what's light and there's always these conflicting themes and i think he sees this as a obscene event at first but then when he thinks about it he he finds more meaning that's out outside of what it appears to be at first glance but that there might be other more deeper meaning towards it yeah i mean i think that's part of it is that I don't even think we're supposed to be able to interpret it mm. immediately because the scene and the woman in the scene recurs <clears throat> at least in two other scenes that I can think of off the top of my head. So we are getting more interpretation of this later. And Mizuguchi, of course, also um, thinks that this woman is a reincarnation of Weiko, his right. old so she's... love who's, de- who's dead. So, yeah, so she's some incarnation of beauty. Yeah, but a very... Uh... strange and surreal scene hard to forget scene yes pretty hard to this is forever burned into my memory uh so that's the end of chapter 2 moving to chapter 3 we get another uh important scene that is also somewhat hard to interpret but first mizuguchi's mother comes to visit the temple and we get all this information about how he doesn't really like his mother Yeah so he doesn't like his mother and and so far we've only heard him talk about his relationship with his, with his father and whenever he's talking about his father he kind of sounds respectful and almost as if he is capable of love almost he never quite says he he loves his father but you can kind of see it in that way but when he's talking about his mother there seems to be like this underlying sense of disgust and even in the scene where she is having a conversation with him she is painted as a you know he says things like she'd made herself look as ugly as she could he clearly does not respect her uh, and the reason for that is because he has a memory from his childhood when he was about when he was a teenager when his father had tb his mother's relative comes to visit them they all sleep under this mosquito net during the summer so you can hear cicadas outside and it's very noisy it's very 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 hot there's a sick person in this mosquito net sleeping in the same space which is that his father there's uh, mizuguchi there's his mother and then the mother's relative who is this strange man who's been deserted by his wife and things transpire and somehow mizuguchi realizes that in fact his uh, from the moment of the mosquito net he realizes that his mother is having sex with this relative yeah him and his dad are both awake right and his father who's sick tries not to cough but stayed with me for a long time because it's <laughs> his father is seeing his wife having sex with someone else in the same area and he tries not to disturb in the case of mizuguchi's father there might be many things that are driving him to act the way he does but The yeah. point is that he never explains anything to Mizuguchi. Or even if he did, clearly Mizuguchi is very puritanical and anything related to unconventional sexual norms, I think he would find disgusting. But you have to think that Mishima is the one writing this. And I was yeah. curious how he, you know, is it because of because he was brought up with by his grandmother and he I think Mishima has all sorts of repressed sexual things going on because you know, he was gay, but I mean clearly he wasn't open about it. That's got to be a big part of it. Like I mean Any time you have to repress your innate sexual desires in some way, I feel like this is the sort of thing that comes out of it. So this scene has a huge impact on Mizuguchi. Since then he forever hit, hits his mother and since then he has a I think strange relationship to sex, maybe, and love, also love, sex and love. I think he sees both of those things very differently. 
uh, and also respect for his father. I feel I feel like he he respected his father a little less from here on. Yeah, so his mother is shows up at the temple mm-hmm. and she reveals that she actually sold Mizuguchi's father's temple so that he won't be able to go back there. And this is sort of her power play to force the Golden Pavilion's superior to make Mizoguchi the next superior. She's crafty, Mizoguchi's mother. She is, yeah, not very likable. <laughs> yeah, so, so from here on, it's kind of decided that uh, Mizoguchi will be kind of the next in line to become the head of the Golden Temple. For the moment, at least, it seems like, in a way, he'll be able to possess the Golden Temple and possess the aesthetic values that it stands for. So Kyoto wasn't bombed during the war because just by chance there was some U.S. official that went to Kyoto, visited it before World War II broke out, and he saw the historical site and he realized that, you know, bombing Kyoto would be a horrible loss for not just Japan, but, you know, for humanity as a, as a cultural center. Kyoto wasn't bombed and the war ends and people are all... When Mizoguchi's mother tells him that Kyoto isn't going to be bombed, he's very surprised by this because he, he really wants it to be bombed because he wants this immense beauty destroyed by an external force. And she seems to... I felt that like when I was reading that, I felt like she kind of seems to know what's what he's really thinking. Do you have that feeling as well? A little, yeah, now that you say that, she's like twisting the knife a little in his, in his jugular or his gut or whatever. She's, I mean, on the outside world to the external world. So whenever she, the mother is shown interacting with other characters such as father, uh, the father superior and so on, she is a very like a country woman, a very simple, uh, she doesn't have money and she's kind of, you know, playing to their, to other people's sympathies. But when she's with Misoguchi alone, she seems yeah. evil. Yeah, she definitely seems sort of like another nihilistic character, sort of like the superior, where she has no values except sex and status, I guess. The war ends, and this breaks that bond that Mizoguchi has with the Golden Temple, because now the Golden Temple, he knows it's not going to be destroyed, it's something eternal, and therefore that bridge that he had, that connection he had with the temple is, is destroyed. Ironically, because the temple is not destroyed. Right. And I think as, as the war uh, ends, uh, interesting things begin to happen. So uh, in the book, uh, Mishima is describing how people are uh, reacting to the, the end of the war. And then he is like, I mean, he reads somewhere or he knows that in Tokyo, people, uh, once the emperor announces that Japan has surrendered, which was on the 15th of August, people uh, went to the imperial palace and they, you know, they stood in crowds and they cried. And in Kyoto as well, people came to Kyoto's imperial palace, which is not uh, inhabited because the capital moved from Kyoto to Tokyo. So there's no one living here in this palace. But a lot of people were standing us and crying. However, no one comes to the Golden Temple. And I think this affects Mizuguchi a lot because he thinks that kind of things that the Golden Temple inspires in him, surely that it must be the same for others within the city. But apparently it's not. So And later, we have this lecture by the superior, which is... A bit confusing. And then this lecture also gets reinterpreted several times throughout the book. In the lecture that the superior gives about the the war's end, the lecture that he gives on the day the war ends is actually a a koan, which is a a Zen riddle or paradox, which means it's supposed to be confusing, so it doesn't don't feel too bad if it doesn't make any sense. And these koans also show up in other pieces of even uh, modern Japanese literature. Like if you read Natsume Soseki's Mon or Gate, uh, is the title of the novel in English. That, uh, that also has a, a koan that is central to the plot line. And, but the koan that the superior relates is called Nansen Kills a Cat. So let's listen to that and then we can try to parse it. One day, when all the monks had gone out to cut the grass, a little kitten appeared in the peaceful mountain temple. Everyone was curious about this kitten. They chased the little animal and caught it. Then it became the object of dispute between the East Hall and the West Hall. Father Nansen, who was watching all this, immediately caught the kitten by the scruff of its neck and, putting his sickle against it, said as follows. If any of you can say a word, this kitten shall be saved. If you cannot, it shall be killed. No one was able to answer, and so Father Nansen killed the kitten and threw it away. When evening came, 
the chief disciple, Joshu, returned to the temple. Father Nansen told him what happened and asked for his opinion. Joshu immediately removed his shoes, put them on his head, and left the room. At this, Father Nansen lamented sorely, saying, Oh, if only you had been here today, the kitten's life could have been saved. So that was uh, Arida Bovu uh, reading from this very intriguing passage in the book. And I had to read it quite a few times, and I still don't really understand it myself. Right. I mean, it's confusing. Mostly the end is confusing, because killing the kitten sort of makes sense in a way, right? Well, why don't they say anything? Why don't they say anything? Also, yeah, that also doesn't make any sense. I read another translation of this koan, though, where it's actually, if you can say any word of Zen, which is more difficult to respond to, because it's like, that isn't as... That is in itself a riddle. Like, what does it mean to say a word of Zin? Ah, um, that makes sense. I think then that's it. Yes, that absolutely yes, makes sense to me. but that doesn't have it in the, this translation. I don't remember what the Japanese original says for this book, the novel. It's a little confusing. And then you also have Joshua's response is confusing. And then Father's nonsense... Father Nansen's response to that response is also confusing. But the ones that are most confused by all of this are our friends Mizuguchi and, well, everyone else who's listening to this uh, this lecture because, because the superior has given this lecture on the day that Japan has surrendered. So he has not mentioned that Japan has lost the war. In some ways, it could mean that in the book, when Father Superior is giving this lecture, he's probably referring to the war in some way. Well, Mizuguchi also sees that Father Superior is very happy because Japan lost the- I mean, my interpretation of this is that Father Nansen is depicted as a sort of weak-willed, sensual person, and he's just completely avoiding the topic of the war. And he's ha- actually happy about it. And that this passage is really just here so that it can be reinterpreted later in terms of the other themes of the book um, with about beauty and being an active person in philosophical terms. It's vague and interpretable in several different ways if you want to try to bend it. So after the war ends, you have some of these references to what's going on post more immediately post-war, where you have black marketeers, and Mizoguchi is sort of attracted by the evilness of these black marketeers, um, which were a major force. You know, it was difficult to get stuff post-war, even like basic food. And then you also have him climbing up under the mountains at night and he sees Kyoto lit up again. I assume not only because, you know, during the war you would have, you would want to save fuel and things like that at night, but also because you don't want to be a bombing target at night. But he looks out and he sees all these lights and he just thinks of all the couples making love under these lights. And then he says that the deed i.e. sex, is like death. So that's a very clear statement of his perception. It seems like Mishima really doesn't like uh, peacetime I and mean, the, the softness that comes with peacetime. I think that's, yeah, I think that's the uh, that's a good interpretation. It's like, it's almost like, it's not so much about what's happening with sex and masturbation in this part. It's more about the war ends and people are just back to basics, living like animals, you know, with very base desires. Whereas yeah, they have no higher values. They have no yeah. higher values, and I think that's the main point. And this this was a very big deal for Mishima because he tried to create his own army and his own way of thinking after that. Although, ironically, during the actual war, he wasn't, like, super into the war. I think he was more focused on, like, writing and things like that. Yeah, so it took him a few years. I think it took a few years after the war for it to sink in that Japan was kind of in a state of rebirth that was had to kind of erase its past and recreate new things, which meant that he himself also had to do that. And he could not find inspiration in what was going on outside, so he kind of had to do it himself. Yeah, he didn't like the new values that were coming into Japan. Right, so uh, the wars ended, and then uh, more visitors start to come to the Golden Temple. Uh, So we have the scene where uh, this American soldier and this prostitute are visiting the Golden Temple. Mizuguchi is giving them a tour in in English. Uh, It's very cold and the soldier is drunk 
I think the prostitute is quite kind of drunk as well. He said in English, "Step on her, will you? Try and step on her." I could not understand what he meant, but there was an expression of command in his blue eyes as he looked down on me from his height. Behind his broad shoulders, I could see the snow-covered golden temple glittering under the dull, blue, washed-out winter sky. There was not the slightest cruelty in his eyes. I do not know why, but at that moment I felt that they were exceedingly lyrical. In this scene, we have again the prefiguring of the burning of the temple, the Golden Pavilion, because you have the prostitute, who is again this incarnation of beauty, and Jack, the American trooper, is is telling Mizoguchi to step on her and assault her and subjugate this this form of beauty. And I think that's why his eyes are quote unquote lyrical because he's urging Mizoguchi on to action and the destruction or subjugation of this uh, ideal of beauty. When the American soldier tells Mizoguchi to step on her, he first feels disgust, but then he feels joy. Yeah. And he he has this kind of I can just imagine this murderer or this convict just, you know, clapping his hands in glee as he's like stepping on this woman in the cold and he's like, yeah. "Oh, this is the woman's stomach and this is the woman's breast. Yay!" And you really you can you can imagine how he feels at that point and he's very immensely dislikable. Or yeah, I mean definitely in a realistic sense he's dislikable. But it's also very an interesting read. It's like a sort of, you know, Poe story where you have that weird psychology going on. Oh, definitely. Oh, this I think Mizoguchi's psychology is what makes this book. But the reason he's stepping on her stomach is because she's pregnant. So the soldier is trying to force an abortion, basically. So Mizoguchi gets some uh, gets a, an award of cigarettes or something, and then he. Uh, goes and gives this to the superior because he doesn't want to. He wants to hide this episode, or he wants to try. He wants to tie Father Dosen up in his uh, malevolent act. To after he gives Father Dosen the cigarettes, at first there's like he doesn't really get any reaction, and he's kind of disappointed because he feels like he's he's done something naughty, and he should get some sort of some sort of give out of that. But then he does get a response when Dawson tells him that he's going to be sent to Otani University. Um, and he's only one of two students that are getting this privilege. So him and Surukawa. But Surukawa is just going because I think his family is paying for it. So Mizoguchi is clearly in line to be the next father, be the next superior for the Golden Pavilion. But this privilege doesn't really last long because already in the next chapter we have... News leaking out that about what happened with the prostitute. Apparently, she came back to the temple and wanted some compensation from the the father, uh, Father Dosen. Mizoguchi feels betrayed by Tsurukawa at this point because Tsurukawa questions him. He doesn't believe Mizoguchi unequivocally. I guess Mizoguchi says Tsurukawa was my positive picture. If Tsurukawa had fulfilled his duty faithfully, he would have asked nothing. He would have asked me nothing but would instead have taken my gloomy sentiments exactly as they were and translated them into cheerful sentiments. So this is where you have the positive option, like the front door of life, so to speak, going out the window and we're you know transitioning to more and more to this nihilistic worldview that Mizoguchi ends up having. Mizoguchi has very high expectations from Tsurukawa. And he doesn't really. I mean, he tries to express this to Surakawa, but does not succeed in, you know, expressing his ideals of what he expects from this relationship. But uh, Surakawa is just being himself, and he's just, you know, all these things we have to realize, like all these feelings that uh, Mizoguchi has. They're his own feelings. They're just his own interpretations and his own method of thinking about one thing for far too long. Yeah. Surakawa doesn't really do anything wrong. It's just Mizoguchi is hypersensitive. Yeah, so at this point, uh, we the reader realizes that uh, the prostitute had, in fact, had a miscarriage the day that she had her stomach trampled on. And that's why it's become such a big deal. 
Mizuguchi's relationship with the superior also begins to deteriorate from this point. He he's almost hundred percent sure that the superior thinks he's guilty. The superior can see right through him, and he can see what his real personality is. Yeah, although again, you have the superior being really passive and just sort of weak as a human being, where he doesn't approach uh, Mizoguchi and. Yeah, there's like a whole. This whole chapter is basically passive aggression. People are kind of skidding past each other in corridors and not looking each other in the eye and kind of thinking all these things but not really saying them to each other. And there's a lot of that going on. We see Father Dosen not really ever confronting Mizoguchi, and we see Mizoguchi just having all these strange thoughts. He's also coming to terms with his own. Uh, sense of accomplishment at participating in this crime. He's beginning to realize how utterly delighted he was at having done this horrendous thing. Yeah, Mizoguchi then passes his college exams, goes to Otani University, and then he makes friends with another student who has a physical handicap named Kashiwagi. And Kashiwagi has two club feet. And they're like two brothers from other mothers. I mean, they immediately click on a weird Mishima style. Where they're like not really the sort of friends, but they're talking about the disgusting things in the world and how horrible the world is. And dialogue at this point is probably the most unrealistic in the entire novel. It bothers me a little bit where because Kashiwagi, so Mizoguchi goes up to Kashiwagi as he's eating lunch in this like patch of clover, and Kashiwagi just like. Launches into this dense spiel about philosoph- philosophy for like several pages where Mizoguchi doesn't even say anything. I don't even know if he says his name. And they both just, he, he, I, I remember the part where he just goes, so Kashibagi go, uh, because you have to remember that Mizoguchi has a stutter, and Kashibagi goes, uh, stutter, go ahead and stutter. And, and at that point, Mizoguchi says, I listened in utter amazement to his peculiar way of expressing himself. And that one, I thought, yes, finally Mishima gives a hint to the reader that what we read until now is completely unrealistic. Well, we'll get into it. But this is section and um, Kashiwagi in general just reminds me of like a character straight out of Dostoevsky, like Brothers Karamazov or something. Yeah. Where everything he says is like a reversal of normal logic. Which was um, Ivan Tyrgenev, who was the one of the great Russian writers, who was contemporaneous with Dostoevsky. That was his criticism of Dostoevsky: was that everything he wrote was just like a a flip, a reversal of normal logic. Right. Yeah, because no one talks like that. Because you know, they ask. This is this is the first time he's meeting this guy. And you have to remember they're at university. They're not like forty year olds with loads of life experience. Uh, and right. You know, he just asks him things like, so, are you a virgin now? I mean, who says yeah. that the first time you meet someone? That's also one of uh, Donald Keane's criticisms about this book, is that, I mean, both of these characters, Mizoguchi and um, Kashiwagi, are, their dialogue and Mizoguchi's internal monologue are just completely unrealistic for the backgrounds that these characters have. Yeah, they're just a mode of, uh, you know, bringing forth Mishima's thoughts, really. Yeah. It's a method. Yeah. Mizoguchi doesn't bother me too much. But I really dislike Kashiwagi. I felt that way too. And I, I wonder why. I mean, Mizoguchi is the one who's thinking about burning up an ancient historic but space. But Mizoguchi is like, it makes sense in a way. Kashiwagi is just like annoying and I feel like irrational. I think also it's because Mishima has given, you know, he's built up Mizoguchi. He's given a lot of... Uh, background so as to why he acts in certain ways and the reader understands a bit more about what he's thinking the whole time whereas Kashi, Kashiwagi is just seen from the perspective of Mizoguchi and we don't know too much about him as a reader and he uses his disability. Kashiwagi details the story of how he lost his virginity with this girl and even this part is just like it completely illogical like this beautiful girl falls in love with him but then he rejects her. It's like, this would never happen in real life. But anyways, so the girl eventually gives herself to him, but then he's impotent or and is unable to consummate it. 
he goes into this long philosophical thing about desire, which is like contradictory and hard to understand. Um, but I think what you can get out of it is that Mishima desire involves embracing your desire demands the forfeiture of your reason for existing, which is your, you know, your, um, your identity and yourself, because I mean, you know, in Western, you know, in Western philosophy and pop culture, you have this idea of two becoming one and you, you know, losing yourself and love and, losing your own individuality in that. Um, and for Mishima, that seems like a, a really bad thing. Yeah, there's certainly a, you know, you can see that there's a conflict in what Mishima himself is feeling right through these passages. I think because because the dialogue is unrealistic, uh, Mishima's voice is a bit louder here and you kind of, you know, you, you see the writer kind of talking to you in a way. Uh, and he's really not even talking to you, he's just talking to himself. Uh, there's a lot of things about what desire is and how how really to feel desire. And he, um, we see Kashi, Kashiwagi talking about feeling like the wind and, and trying to sort of liberate himself to feel the sense of desire. And I think as I was reading it, I imagined if uh, Mishima himself was trying to figure out his sense of how he could be more liberated and at and, and peace with himself. Clearly has some issues to work out. But as Kashiwagi continues, after this philosophical passage about desire, we get another sort of more concrete episode where one day Kashiwagi, who's also uh, a Buddhist priest in training or acolyte, uh, one day he goes to recite the sutras for an old widow on the day that her husband had passed so it's a hot day and kashiwagi undresses and well he asks if he can take a bath and you know so he undresses and the, and the old woman is bathing him and then he tells her that as a child he was marked by the buddha his feet were marked by the buddha and he starts he lays down and starts chanting a sutra and we have this passage in the midst of this ugly service I realized I was physically excited. Yes, without dreaming about myself in the slightest. Yes, under the most ruthless of all conditions. I sat up abruptly and pushed the old woman over. I didn't even have time to think it strange that she showed no surprise at my action. The old widow lay there where I had pushed her, with her eyes shut tight and still reciting the sutra. Before my eyes, the face of an old woman in her sixties a sunburned face without any makeup seemed to welcome me. My excitement did not abate in the slightest. Yeah, so Kashiwagi sleeps with the woman that he goes to recite a religious chant for on the day that her husband had died. Not well on, on the day that he that marked the day that her husband had died. But this helps this helps them understand the meaning of life and love and desire and everything. This is like answers all his questions. This is Kashiwagi's solution to the problem of beauty for him, personally. Because as he's having sex with this older woman, he realizes that, you know, all of the women, even the really beautiful ones, really, they're all, they all look like this woman. They're all ugly, and their beauty is valueless, basically. And so through his re this realization, through this knowledge and sort of, moment of enlightenment he's able to subject beauty to his own his own understanding on the contrary like if you looked at this episode in a different way he could have he could have thought that all women are beautiful in this way but he did he doesn't he could have thought that you know beauty is actually immaterial and kashiwagi is the like prototypical nihilist right i mean he's the one that's destroying all of these old values and not putting any, he doesn't really have any new values that he's trying to assert. And so after Kashiwagi finishes his philosophizing to Mizoguchi, they skip class and go for a walk. And just as Kashiwagi be begins describing the type of woman who finds a, a club-footed man attractive, 
we have the end of the chapter. And on that note, we come to the close of this episode. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Follow us on, on uh, social media, and the details of some of the books and articles we referenced in this episode are also on our website. Watch this space for the next episode, we, where we continue to discuss the Temple of the Golden Pavilion by Mishima Yukio.